Um, my name is Sarah Blaine. I'm the events coordinator here, and so it really means a lot um, to see such a wonderful crowd on a Monday evening for a work of fiction. And I'm so pleased uh, to welcome Roddy Doyle here tonight um, back to Politics and Prose um, for his new book. It was 1987 when the world met Jimmy Rabbit, a scrappy kid putting together a band in Dublin. The book was The Commitments, and now Jimmy is back in The Guts. He's dealing with middle-aged problems, including a cancer diagnosis, and he's trying to reconnect with his past. Um, I liked what Mark Athetakis had to say in his review today in The Post. He said, the feat of the guts is Doyle's ability to create in Jimmy a character who hangs together even while so many of his certainties have collapsed, and to get a few good jokes in as well. Roddy Doyle is the author of nine novels, including one of this bookseller's favorites, The Van. This is my tatty copy that I brought. And he won the Booker Prize in 1993 for Patty Clark, Ha Ha Ha. Please join me in welcoming Roddy Doyle to Politics and Press. Thank you very much. I left Dublin yesterday. It was raining. <laughs> Woke up this morning and thought I was in Dublin. But nevertheless, clearly I'm not. Uh, thank you very much for coming here. It's lovely. Um, as was said, I, I, the Commitments was published in 1987. It still terrifies me when I do my maths and <laughs> figure out just how long ago that is. I wrote it in 1986, the first half of 1986, and I've no idea, having written, you know, quite a lot since then, just how I managed to write even a short novel in six months. It's just, I, I've no memory of... I've, mem I've memories of writing the thing, but I've no memory of, I suppose, cluelessness, because it was the first one. <laughs> I didn't realize to be a literary author, I was supposed to spend 12 years writing it. <laughs> so I got it out of the way in six months, and I wish the fuck I could do that again, but it <laughs> seems to, it's part of, I put it down to age. But I've written 10 novels, and there's only one that stands alone, uh, uh, Paddy Clark, ha, ha, ha. I've never gone back to him. He was 10 in 1968. I could have added, you know, gone back to him in 1978 or something, but I've no curiosity about him. And uh, outside of the words in the book, the, he has no existence. I mean, it seems like a brutal thing to say, but it's actually <laughs> the truth. You know, he has no existence. I got, you know, particularly 20 years ago, 21 years ago when the novel came out, I got these lovely letters. I hope he's happy now. <laughs> you know, the temptation to write back, he doesn't exist. <laughs> was luckily not quite overpowering, so I left them away. And I remember somebody, I think because they do this, they, they look at the bio and see, oh, he was born in 1958, Paddy Clark was born in 1958, therefore he is Paddy Clark. And I think perhaps there was a concern that I mightn't be happy. And, um, well, you know, I am, reasonably. But it was, it, there was also a question about, um, what does he do now? So I said he was a bureaucrat in Brussels. <laughs> and the woman who asked me, her face kind of solidified in front of me. And I felt so cruel that I'd probably destroyed the novel by writing a little sentence, in fact, to go at the end of the novel. So I'm, um, I, but I don't know why I started all that, but... Um, <laughs> It's, I suppose, in part, an explanation as to why I went back to Jimmy Rabbit. I leave the characters alone. I've never killed any, or I've never killed any of the major characters. They all tend to be alive at the end of the... You know, the temptation at the end of the Henry Smart books, he's 107, 109, but he's still alive because, you know, he's the narrator, so he has to be alive. <laughs> and I wasn't going to do cheat and say, now I'm up in heaven, and I'm happy, you know. I wasn't going to cheat and do that. So they're all alive at the end. And I'm, there was one book, The Woman Who Walked Into Doors, and ten years after I'd finished it, I was suddenly very curious about Paula Spencer, the narrator of that book, and I went back to her, and I'm glad I did. And ten years after that one, I possibly will do it again. I don't know, I haven't decided, but it's an open invitation if I ever want to use it. And again, outside of the books, she has no existence. I kind of used to hate saying that, now I quite enjoy it. <laughs> but So I, what spurred me to go back to Jimmy Rabbit after quite a considerable time were, were two things, really. One to do with the Irish economy, and one to do with growing older. Uh, the Irish economy is, for those of you who have any interest in it, collapsed spectacularly some years ago. 
And almost immediately, the radio, um, as I listened to a lot of radio, particularly in the mornings, but there was a lot of, not analysis as such, but almost, uh, if, if, if an economy can have a profile, profile pieces and explanation, rather glib explanations of the word recession. It had disappeared out of daily usage for a while, and now it was back. And more than once, I heard in the background, as a kind of almost giddy economist was explaining what a recession was, a 1980s song popping away behind. So literally, I heard a, a kind of a, an economist from University College Dublin explaining that a recession, while Annie Lennox was singing. <laughs> Can't remember which song it was. You know, a good eurythmic song, and no objection to them at all whatsoever. Wonderful voice, but it, se it seemed just. I don't know. It made me angry. It made me genuinely angry. And it struck me that the people putting these programs together were, you know, reliving their heydays when, you know, they were students in the 80s. Dope, magic mushrooms, money from their parents, you know, before mortgages, children, reality beckoned, or a different reality beckoned. And it began, I began thinking about the characters I made up in the 1980s in the last recession in Ireland, which we called normal life, because we weren't aware of the fact that there was any alternative. It was what we grew up with. And it struck me that you know, this lazy nostalgia for the 80s was missing the point and that this was a new thing. This recession was a new thing. We were now dealing with new young people who never knew what it was to have unemployed relatives, who expected jobs and whose parents expected them to have jobs, who might leave Ireland from choice, not from necessity. So that's what, in part, drove me back to these characters. I was wondering how they were getting on added 25, six or seven years to them to see how they were getting on. And the other thing then is, uh, um, just growing older, <clears throat> I've been writing short stories sporadically for the last 15 years or so about middle-aged men, because I quite happily conceded that I was one or becoming one. And one of the great things about being a writer is that you can use this material, the daily humiliations, you know, the, you know the first grunt when you go down to pick up something? And at heart, I don't know what's going on there, because I'm reasonably fit. I don't have to grunt, but it would appear that after a certain age, <laughs> there's this inbuilt, it's almost like a teddy bear, you know? <laughs> you, have to, you have to grunt. You don't want to do it. Talking to yourself is another one. Forgetting to button your fly is a standard one among men. There are heads nodding away there, another a few men in denial, but, you know, we know who we are. I have a friend who's abandoned button zips altogether. He's got he the button flies. He's, he's, he's on the verge of abandoning trousers. He's just going to wear tracksuit <laughs> track bottoms for the rest of his life. You know, he can't bear the terror of leaving a public toilet in a, anymore. And these little things uh, and bigger things have crept up. And Not so long ago, and still, I meet friends regularly, particularly Thursday evenings, people I grew up with, men I grew up with. We've known each other since we were children, really. Met, you know, the closest of us, three of us. We, we were put sitting beside each other in our first day at high school, which when we were 12. And now, you know, 43, 44 years later, we're still friends. We meet. We've, uh, you know, watched ourselves get married, have children, in the case of two grandchildren. There used to be five of us, there's now four of us, because one died of cancer. And cancer propped up as a regular topic in amongst us, you know. Uh, it used to be football, that's soccer, the real football. Uh, <laughs> music, politics, families, children. Then cancer appeared. And uh, different types of cancer. I had a, a medical some years ago, and the, the doctor assured me I was too old for testicular cancer. And the twin feelings, oh shit, I'm too old for te testicular cancer. <laughs> With, oh great, I'm too old for testicular cancer. <laughs> and before I could get too giddy about it, he told me the, the cancers I was, you know, just ripe for. <laughs> and it's a daily, not an event, but it's a daily thought. The radio, all over the place for people of my age. I grew up on a housing estate that was built in the, early, in the early 1950s, and my parents moved into the house in 1951, along with people that are exactly their same age, people in their mid-twenties. They all had children at the same time. And for the last couple of years, I've spent regular times going to funerals. These people are dying. And it's a point where I'm meeting people, again, my own age, haven't seen some of them in a long, long time, and we only meet at funerals. And we're laughing about it at this point, because it seems like, uh, I think, three funerals in the last month. And there's another few on the way. 
and uh, it, it, so these things again the great thing about being a writer is that you can use this stuff it does mean granted that very few people read it anymore but <laughs> that that's not the point and nor is it therapeutic I haven't had cancer myself you know uh, I'm glad it is fiction but uh, because this book is to a degree about cancer but um, you know you write about these things it doesn't make you feel any better I just want to assure you of that if anybody tries to con you into thinking that you'll, if you pay a thousand dollars to do this writing course you will feel much better no you don't you don't really at all but you can use this material anyway to, to but anyway I'm gonna um, so these were the things that brought me back to the book you know middle age and economics and the fact that the room isn't emptying would seem to indicate that it's <laughs> it's still raining outside so I'm gonna read just a, one passage from the book um, it's early on in the book Jimmy Rabbit who as he formed the commitments as some of you might know way back in 1986 or 87 is now eight, is now 47 he's got four children and he also has cancer of the bowel and he uh, hasn't had an opportunity or he hasn't been able to pluck up the courage to tell his wife he has told his father because he felt it was easier just to tell his father and as a writer I wanted to get his father into the story first because I like his father but he is now looking for an opportunity to tell his wife. He filled the dishwasher. He took, a white w he took a white wash out to the line and hung the clothes in the dark. He kept an eye on the kitchen window while he did it to see if Aoife was alone in there. She wasn't. He watched her, angry and gorgeous, giving out shite to Mahalia. He came back in. She was gone. He made tea. He didn't drink it. He emptied the dishwasher. She came in, followed by Brian, then Mahalia. He tapped Brian on the shoulder. Come here. You as well, May. He brought them into the telly. He pointed at it. That's a television. Brian laughed. Now, said Jimmy, you sit in front of it. That's right. Good man. Perfect. He held up the remote. Have you seen one of these before? Yep, said Brian. Good man again, said Jimmy. You can watch it for half an hour, OK? I already had my half hour, said Brian. You're too honest, Smoke, said Jimmy. I told you. Be a bit sneaky. Sneaky. That's right, said Jimmy. Have you had your telly today yet, Smokey? No. Have you not? Well, here you go. Jimmy lobbed the remote at him, and Smokey, that was Brian, caught it. I don't want to watch telly, said Mahalia. Jimmy kept forgetting she was 13, although she looked it. He'd never get used to it. His oldest child, Marvin, was a 17-year-old man. The youngest, Brian, was too big to be picked up. Just do me a favour, May, said Jimmy. Stay here for a bit. I need to talk to your mother. Begging forgiveness, are we? said Mahalia. Something like that, he said. Good luck with that, she said. Is that eyeshadow you're wearing? Did you just ask me to do you a favour, Dad? <laughs> I did, yeah. The eyeshadow was my business then, said Mahalia. You don't need it, you know. That's not an argument. I love you. So you should. He left them there. Brian wouldn't budge, and Mahalia loved being involved in the messy, stupid world of the adults, even if involvement meant staying out of the kitchen for half an hour. But Aoife was gone. There was a kid with his head in the fridge and he wasn't one of Jimmy's. Who are you? The kid stood up and fair play to him, he blushed. I'm hungry, he said. Good man hungry, said Jimmy. And what are you doing pulling the door off my fridge? The kid looked confused. Got, it got, his red got redder. Jimmy felt like a bollocks. Jimmer said you wouldn't mind or Mrs. your wife like. Are you Mr. Rabbit? Yeah. Jimmer said she, Mrs. Rabbit, like, wouldn't mind if I, like, got something to eat. Jimmer was young Jimmy, another of Jimmy's sons. The kid's face had gone past red. He was turning black in front of Jimmy. He was holding a chicken leg. Will I put it back? He was an old-fashioned young fella. Did you eat any of it, said Jimmy. Kind of, said the kid. <laughs> he looked at the leg. Yeah. You'd better eat the rest of it, so, said Jimmy. Thanks. Where's Jimmy? Your son like? Yeah, upstairs. Grand. We're doing a project, said the kid. What's your name? Garth. What? Garth. Now what's the project about Garth? Super Tramp. What? <laughs> the group like? You mean the group that was shite back in the 70s, 20 years before you were born and probably even shiter now? <laughs> no way are they shite, said Garth. Who listens to them? I do, said Garth. Jimmy liked Garth and he liked the feeling that he liked him. And tell us, Garth, he said, are you some sort of born-again Christian trying to convert my son to Supertramp? <laughs> no way, said Garth. He converted me. He what? 
He said the CD is yours. It isn't. He says it is, says Gart. It's old looking and the price on the sticker is an old punce, like, not euros. Aoife walked in. Tell Gart here, said Jimmy. Gart was turning black again and he was trying to put the chicken leg into his pocket. <laughs> Tell him what? That I hate Supertramp, said Jimmy. You don't, said Aoife. I do. Don't listen to him, Gart, said Aoife. He loves them, or he used to. She walked across the kitchen. Gart was trying to get away from her. He looked like he was going to climb up onto the sink. Go on then, Jimmy said to Aoife. Name one Super Tramp song. She hadn't a clue. She never had. Dreamer, said Aoife. The logical song. Breakfast in America. Take the long way home. It's raining again. I think that's the order they're in on the greatest hits collection you used to play all the time. <laughs> Is your dad a music fascist too, Garth? <laughs> Don't know. Jimmy gave up. There was no point in trying to talk to Aoife now. Not about Super Tramp. Fuck Super Tramp. About the cancer. He went in and sat with Brian for a while. He sent Brian up to bed, then sent Garth home and the others went to bed. It was running taps and the toilet flushing for about an hour and, the qu and quiet shouts and a loud thump that must have been Marvin giving young Jimmy a dig or young Jimmy giving Marvin a dig. He hadn't seen either of them all night, but the house was full of them. And he could hear Mahalia singing. He sat in the dark and listened to the life above him. I'll miss this. He hadn't felt it coming and he got rid of it quickly, sentimental shite. Now he lay on the bed with Aoife. She was crying onto his chest, and he liked it. I bet Supertramp have a song about cancer, he said. Fuck off, you. I never liked them. She lifted her head. You did? OK. She put her head back down. You're such a baby. That's why you love me. He heard her gulping back the tears, trying to stop. Sorry, he said. She said nothing. I had to tell you. I knew, she said. Knew? Yes. She patted his stomach. How? Did someone phone you? They'd no right. No. They spoke softly. The bedroom door was open a bit in case Brian woke. I just knew, said Aoife. You weren't yourself. So I had cancer. Something was wrong. It was in your face. I should have told you. Yes. I was going to. Why didn't you? I was going to tell you that I was going for, a te for the test, said Jimmy. Then I decided, I suppose, to wait till after. If it was clean, she hit him. He hadn't. He could never have expected this. It was like she'd driven her fist right through him. Jesus! He got his hand to her shoulder and shoved her away, almost over the side of the bed. Shit! He reached out to grab her, but she wasn't falling. They were both breathless and scared. Her hair was shorter these days, but it was still hanging over her eyes. The silence was loud and colossal. A mobile phone buzzed. Fuck! They both jumped. The shock. Yours, said Aoife. I should explain, those of you who don't know, sorry, the, the name Wayne Rooney is going to come up. He's a English footballer. She exhaled, she exhaled and breath lifted her fringe. It doesn't matter, said Jimmy. Go on, she said. It doesn't matter, he said. It's only a fucking text. It's your dad, she said. He's the only one who texted you this late. There was no hostility in what she said. He, phoned, he found the phone and she was right. It was from his da. Wayne fucking Rooney. <laughs> Is anything wrong? Aoife asked. No, said Jimmy. Not really. It's grand. I'm sorry. Me too. She was on her knees at the end of the bed. On the side of the bed, sorry. She was on her knees on the side of the bed. Jimmy leaned across and she let him hug her. Her face was wet. He kissed it. He didn't cry and that seemed good. I'd better answer him, he said. He knew he, he was, he knew, sorry, he knew she was looking at him, looking for difference or slowness or blood stains. He picked up the phone, he wrote or whatever it was called, texted, complete cunt. He sent it back to his da. He put the phone on the floor and lay back. I know I should have told you, he said. It's OK. I thought it would go away. Fucking stupid. Once I did the right thing and made the appointment. I understand. It was stupid. So are lots of things, I suppose. Anyway, I didn't want to worry you. That's the truth. Then I found out. He stopped for a while. He was grand. And I was stunned, he said. Fucking... When I went back to work after, and I eventually had to talk, this fucking twit wondering where an order was supposed to go. When I opened my mouth, there was no jaw. I couldn't feel it. Like I'd been to the fucking dentist. As if going to the, here we go, oncologist. Impressed? Good lad. As if going to the fucking oncologist hadn't been enough. I had to, I had to drop in on the dentist on the way back. But your man didn't notice. Is he really a twit? No. No, he's grand. He's young. Oh, that? Yeah, so anyway, I came home. And I was going to tell you, that was the plan. I even stopped off at Super Value and bought a bottle of wine, remember? Yes. I had it all mapped out, the two of us in the kitchen, some fucking hope. Brian had a match, that's right. I drank the wine while you were gone, that's right. 
well I opened it you drank it ok not all of it grand anyway I wasn't pissed you were all over me said Jimmy later like he looked at her you rode a man with cancer Jesus <coughs> and I couldn't tell you after that I wouldn't have believed you that's music to my fucking ears now he cried he couldn't help it actually he wanted to he felt no better and he felt no worse but it seemed natural something she'd have wanted to see reassurance and then he couldn't stop for a while thank you Uh, I'm happy to answer questions you might have about the work, anything. And if there are questions, please go to one of our two microphones. Sure. Thank you for flying over. Hi, I was uh, sitting there listening to you and I was thinking, well, how is Jimmy different than he was uh, 25 years ago? How has he grown? And then I began to think, has he grown? <laughs> so I guess I'm asking the question, how is Jimmy different now than he was Well, he's significantly then? older. He has children. He's, so he has grown, of course. I don't know how you measure that. I don't, I don't, um, I'm not a great believer in maturity. <laughs> uh, I'm not a great, I don't buy into it. I live, and I live a very quiet life. I'm not, you know, I'm not some sort of a wild cartoonish Irish writery figure. I live a very, very quiet life, so I'm not talking about, you know, going wild and being silly. But I'm not a great believer in maturity. It's why w I retain a great love of football. And I, I actually like when I see grown people, men and women, screaming at a television, or better yet, screaming at a football game, and kind of applauding and getting tearful about the, you know, the skill of people who are a third of their age. I really like that. And I like it when I'm playing music not so much the stuff I grew up with, but when I hear a piece of music that's being played by people the same age as my children, and I just think it's really, really great, or it reminds me of the Velvet Underground or something like that, uh, that's, a very, that's a joyous event for me. So in that regard, I suppose Jimmy is a bit similar, you know, but as to how, he's just older. <laughs> you know, that's it, really. You know, I think that Victorian notion that childhood is a preparation for the rest of it, it's pretty grim, you know, so I don't buy into it at all, you know, so he's just older, not necessarily wiser, although it's very hard not to be a bit wiser somehow. Even though like, life, lifetime alcoholics are aware of the fact that they're lifetime alcoholics <laughs> and they possibly in one or two circumstances would rather not be. But, so that's a certain wisdom, but they don't have to live by that. You know, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question really, but, uh, yeah, I hope, in a way, 20 years on, when I'm in my 70s, I hope I can still be shouting at the television. You know, I hope I can see the television. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly trying to climb into the television the way, the way things are going. Thank now. you. Thank you. Well, well, at least you'll have a remote, so you have to get it. Anyway, uh, you've written for a stage and mm -hmm. screen and novels, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the different mental gymnastics you go through for each of those different um, medium? Yeah, well, the jump from, I suppose, they, the one that's most recent really is uh, The Commitments, which I adapted for the stage most recently. It's a, it's a musical now in the West End of London. It's been running since September, and I hope will stay for quite a while. Um, whether it does or not, I don't know, but what is it now? February, so so far so good. Now, what I'd never written a musical before and possibly won't again. It was just a once-off opportunity, but... What becomes apparent, I, and I hadn't read the book in years, I hadn't read the commitments in oh, years since I, I was involved in the writing of the script for the movie, but the script, my involvement in that finished, I'd say somewhere around 1989 perhaps, so I hadn't opened the book since. So the songs in the, commit, in the novel are there because I like them. You know, they had potential, humorous potential, I could superimpose a bit of Dublin on them, but essentially I liked them. And they were available. The, the US edition of the Commitments has two different songs to the British and Irish edition of the Commitments because the rights weren't available for publication here. I can't remember which songs they are, but I had to do a very quick rewrite for the, uh, for the American edition of the Commitments. But it was almost as whimsical as that. I had to find a song that would fit the gap, you know? But when it came to writing the musical, the songs had to be, uh, they had to, in a way, help tell the story. So I needed a song, for example, where the band members, individuals who hadn't really worked together or played together, would go in at one end of the song and come out reasonably 
what would you say, uh, reasonably proficient at the other end of the song so that we could get on with the show. And after all, it was a musical, so we couldn't spend the whole night watching the band learn to play their instruments because <laughs> musicals tend to break out into song much sooner. So I... Um, Listen, uh, you know, listening for months, it's no great hardship listening to songs, but when actually you have to choose songs, it becomes a bit like homework. You know, you love a novel, but then you have to read it three times and answer questions on it, and you hate it quite quickly. <laughs> but luckily, I didn't uh, fall out of love with the music, but um, unlike the movie, I went back into Motown, because Motown does I exist in the novel. But I went back to Motown, and I chose uh, You Keep Me Hanging On, the Supreme song. Perfect, simple, lovely, lovely song, and Jimmy could, you know get the individual band members playing their instruments and then the, the singers could get gradually better and they get better and better and better throughout the song. Later on, I needed a song that would perhaps indicate that if anything, they were a bit too good. They'd reached a level of sophistication that might indicate that they were going to implode or explode or whatever it is. And again, I went back to Motown and Papa was a Rolling Stone. One, because it's brilliant. And it has a rather young introduction with a bit of tension in it. And then it's so glorious you know, when it explodes or whatever into what it is. And so these songs I, I put in. So you're choosing, you know, for one, you're choosing songs to be read, but the other, you're choosing songs to be heard and to drive the narrative. And also, you become aware when you're writing the thing. With a movie, you can cut, you have faces, you have the audience, you have Deco's face close up and, the, you know, the strain on his voice and it is there on his face. And you have all these moments, but on the stage you don't. So you have to, you know, pull back and kind of always remember there's somebody 20 rows back or 40 rows back or up at the very top. And the songs, these, this influences your choice of songs as well and what you can do. But I think essentially, really, when it comes to either writing a novel or collaborating, because that is essentially what, if you're lucky, that's what it becomes, is that you have to leave the novelist. In, in my case, the attic where I work, my office, the novelist has to stay there and you have to enter into the spirit of the thing that you're working with other people. And I've never found any, I've never had any difficulty with that. I suppose it's the opportunity to su do something different. So, and as well, I, I was aware of the fact, for example, that whatever happens to the, you know, whatever, say, adapting the van, my third novel, into a movie. And I, I always felt that whatever happens, if the van is still the van, it's still the novel, it's safe. It's not going to be tarnished or wrecked by a bad movie. And in fact, I like the movie. So it a, it's always a bit of a gamble. But uh, I'd never be precious. You know, I'd never be precious. And a lot of experimentation and you're dealing, you know, there was, uh, I was over in London for 10 weeks during rehearsals of the musical and at one point uh, I was sitting with the producer and I asked him how many people are in the building, it was this Palace Theatre in the West End, he said 172 or something like that, he said I'm paying 172 and I thought that was incredible, really brilliant that all these people were being employed to put together this, this musical entertainment, I just thought it was fantastic, you know, so there, it's, um, the exercise, what they have in common really at one point is the words, but the use of the words is very, very different. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, if, I, if, if there was some sort of a form and I had to fill in job description, I, I would never choose author because I think it's very limiting. I put writer in, and that allows, if you like, within the definition to do work that I do. I'm essentially a novelist. If, if I had to, you know, retreat into one form, I'd be writing novels, I think, and quite content in it. But when the opportunity is there to do other works, I... And if it works out, I, I, I grab it. Now, what happens over the years is that there quite more scripts end up on a shelf than do, if you like, in the in the um, in the movie house, which is a pity. But that's part of the thing as well. And, and just one other comment: I think the person you referred to earlier, who was treating your characters as real characters, I think that's because they resonate off the page. Oh, well, I'm glad real. of that. Yeah, but that's that's if you like, that's yeah. what that's what I work at. Yeah. Okay. That's what I do, you know, and I leave plenty of gaps. I leave gaps. I don't describe the characters really. I have no real interest in their physical appearance. I think, you know, I just don't. But people seem to fill in those gaps right. themselves. So they have a very firm idea of what Jimmy looks like or what Imelda uh, from The Commitments looks like, you know. Uh, even before she was cast in the movie. And I, I don't think there's a reference to hair colour at all. She was described in one early review as a, that, uh, that kind of cliche, a, bl a blonde bombshell which said more about the reviewer than it did about the, <laughs> <laughs> the writer. Yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, I've, <clears throat> I've been reading you for a long time, but I've only recently come across your Facebook dialogues that you've been posting. Yep. 
Um, in fact, I have sent your recent definition of a consultant uh, to several of my <laughs> friends. Uh, I just, but is there a backstory to that, or is there? A, are yeah, they, it ties are, in actually. With are they going to be something, or? Yeah, uh, yeah. I um, I opened a Facebook account. Maybe I'm not sure. I, I was starting this novel, and. The central character, Jimmy, who's involved in on, the online music, selling music online, needs a Facebook account. And I knew nothing about Facebook except for the fact that it existed. I really didn't know anything about it. And I'd seen the movie, which I enjoyed, but I found that it's more off-putting than anything. I didn't want to be in that world, you know? <laughs> so I, I, I didn't know anything about it. So I was asking my older children, and my younger one as well, you know, what's it all about? And you can tell, you know, they're basically, they... they they wouldn't tell me to fuck off, but basically, <laughs> they were, you know, it was kind of mind your own business. So I opened up my own account, you know, just to see what it looked like. And now I had a sense of what it looks like. So now I could start writing about it without becoming, you know, I'm not describing it in any great detail. But within a few days, I had this friend request from people I used to teach. I was a high school teacher from 1979 to 1993. And there was a name that struck me, really familiar, you know. And I said, oh, Christ, yeah, that she was, I, I used to teach her. And she'd left school in 1982. I hadn't seen or heard her of her since. And she, you know, asked to, to be my friend. And it's an easy click. There you go. <laughs> and I'm just looking, <laughs> how is she now? And I saw widowed, marital status, widowed. And, I, you know, you're thinking, how could that 17-year-old kid be widowed? But then, you know, it's stupid. It's as if, you know, it's a bit we turn our back on people and we expect them to say exactly as they were. Or we go to a place and we come back 20 years later and bitterly resent the modernity. <laughs> bitterly resent the fact that they have a life approximating our own. You know, and uh, uh, eventually hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of old students of mine uh, got in touch. Some of whom I would have seen anyway, because I live quite close. And a lot of them went to the same schools as my own went to. But others I hadn't heard or seen. They're all over the world, including here probably in Washington. And I thought that was great. And I began to see, you know, there's the usual, the drivel, the puppies and, you know, <laughs> kittens. And there's also the burning need. If somebody close to you dies, you have to announce it on Facebook before you tell the rest of the family, really, you know. <laughs> and and like, I'm feeling low today, dot, 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 dot. <laughs> if you are really my friend, you know, and all this stuff. And it's a bit creepy in that way. But there was other... <laughs> great stuff, you know, and a, a lot of very good writers were there as well, and I was just, I said, well, what, what can I do? And it was, there was a, a, a kind of a mad couple of days where it, it kind of gave the country a bit of a lift. The Queen came to, the Queen of England, that is, uh, as opposed to Denmark or Sweden or all those other places. <laughs> the, the Queen of England came to Ireland, first monarch to visit the Republic since before it was a Republic, and it was great. It was brilliant, you know, even the way it was choreographed was terrific. And then she was only gone when Obama arrived, you know. And that was great, you know, because the Queen didn't drink her Guinness, and Obama did. Because <laughs> she doesn't need the votes, and he does. <laughs> and so it was a great few days, you know, it was a bit of crack. And I began to imagine two middle-aged men in a pub just talking about it. And that was the first one I wrote. I just wrote two, and I decided very early on, I'll limit it to 200 words. I don't want this to be too much of a preoccupation. And I'll do it sporadically. So I would download uh, or upload or whatever it is, sideways load, a photograph of two pints of Guinness right, yeah. and just have the dialogue beside it or under it, wherever it would fit. And I do it once a week, once every two weeks, twice a week. So in that year, um, I can't remember, poor old Whitney Houston died. Uh, Davy Jones from the Monkees died. Bill Everly. That was more recently, yeah. yeah. They, you know, so often when a, a, a rock pop legend dies, and if it resonates with the two lads, not if it's some avant-garde artist. And for example, I, I although I was in, I was travelling yesterday when I heard that um, Philip Seymour Hoffman died. It was very, very sad. But I was thinking, will I get up and just write something? But I wouldn't. Be, I decided not to because he. He wouldn't be a name in, the, in these two lads. Um, they'd recognize him, but they wouldn't be admirers. He's just in the movie, so to speak. Right. You know? So I decided to stay away from him. It wasn't laziness on my part. Or, but um, so it grew. And it has the first batch have been published on the other side of the Atlantic, yeah. Oh, really? And uh, there's another batch coming out in September. So they have been published, yeah. But it was just an accident. Somebody wanted to publish them almost like a book of poetry. 
And I've never written a poem in my life. And it's not an ambition of mine at all, but I kind of like the idea. It just seemed nice. And so it's a little slim volume. And it was published in Britain and Ireland and been translated into Italian. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. So, um, yeah, it just grew from there. The most popular in terms of likes, I don't know quite how you measure these things, but in terms of likes, and this is a surprise to me, in terms of likes and sharing, by a distance, the most popular was one of when Lou Reed died. Not, funnily enough, there was a great reaction to one I did about Maeve Binchy's death and Seamus Heaney's death, but the one that really, if it was Lou Reed, for some reason. And I don't think it was because it was better than the others, but obviously, uh, Lou Reed, uh, at the risk of sounding sentimental, lives on. So uh, that was the, the big surprise. The more parochial ones, you know, the ones that are Irish-based or whatever, about the Irish politics or whatever, they tend to get fewer likes, which is fair enough. And the ones then that have maybe an international element to them tend to get more. Have these characters filled out in your head the no. longer you've been doing no. it? Or? No, no. Two They're lads. They're just voices? Two lads, yeah. yeah. Two lads. They have families that, they, you know, I don't... Again, I, I, most of them, I sometimes, I'm do, I do, might do a bit of work with um, teenagers on a Wednesday or a Thursday. When I'm walking home, I often have it in my head, composed when I get home. And I just type it out and then do the word count and trim it a bit to make sure and then put it up and that's the end of that. But it's just a side, bar. I do a lot of side stuff that I enjoy. But it's been suggested that we make little animations of it, and I said, no, or a stage thing, and I said, no, lights on, lights <laughs> off, you know. <laughs> two lads then, the lights go off, and then they're sitting like that, and 200 words, and then they're sitting like this, and it'd be just awful, you know. So, uh, no, I think it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's just paper. It's on, or whatever the equivalent of Facebook paper is. It's just, that's it, you know. But um, they, it's just a... I enjoy it. And now and again, I'd get something off my chest, you know. Cranky man, I'd just get something <laughs> off my chest. Thank you. Hello. Um, yes, thank you. Um, as a student of Irish literature, um, I, well, I'd like to get your reality check. It, it seems to me that a common theme in Irish literature is dashed hope. Um, I, I think about your book, The Commitments. I think about Playboy of the Western World, where, you know, things seem to be going really well but then they don't, mm -hmm. and that's the end of the story. Is it? it yeah. Well, yeah. Well, can stories, you react to that, other please? Other cultures, things are going terrible, and then they go well. <laughs> you see, but we <laughs> we thought there might be more money in doing it the other way around. <laughs> no, I've never actually seen it that way. I, I, it's an interesting one, but stories have to have the hump, you know. So there's the beginning, the middle, and the end. And the commitments, yeah, I mean, there's nothing profound about the commitments. I mean, I, at the same time I was writing the commitments, a friend of mine, we co-wrote it, we co-published the commitments. We did, you know, I self-published it with this friend of mine, John Sutton, in Dublin in 1987. And as I was writing the commitments, he was doing research for an art centre. They were doing, they were thinking of um, opening up studio space in the basement. And he was doing research on bands and how long they lasted and the rest. And the, the average life of a band in Dublin was the same as a human pregnancy, you know, nine months. <laughs> and the first person to go was always the drummer. So it's not just spinal tap, you know, it was just, that was the fact. So the band form, and then inevitably the band have to break up. And it would be better, actually, I think in most cases we'd agree, if they all broke up, you know. You know, it might be good to go and see the Rolling Stones or whatever, but it would be actually better if they'd broken up in 1970. <laughs> really, it would. Because then they could, you know, well, well, though we won't go there. But the Snapper books that, for example. The Snapper is, you know, she, this girl, again, I started writing that in late 1986. She's pregnant outside marriage. And it ends, she has the baby. So her hopes aren't dashed. It's a perfectly healthy baby. But yeah, you're right. In other circumstances, the... Uh, Hopes are dashed. Uh, but I don't have anything really profound to say about that, I'm afraid. No. It's, it's, it's part of the, you know, what movie, ma movie people call the arc, I think, of somehow or other. It's the story. Um, yeah, it's just the story. Is it unique to Ireland? I don't know. Thank you. Sorry I can't be more help to you. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Hi, thanks for, for coming here. Uh, I came out this, this evening because I heard you on the radio this morning and you were talking about uh, growing up in that house, the 1951 uh, house, and being able to go across the road and you moved out of Dublin 5 uh, into County, into Dublin. County yeah. Dublin. I'm from, I'm from Malahide and, and mm. went to Chanel College. And so I remember that exact 
uh, kind of time of the huge mushrooming growth of that Dublin Five area. Yeah. Thousands and thousands of people coming in. Just, but just seem to be thousands of houses being built, Darndale and all that kind of mm, stuff out mm. the Malahide Road. Yeah. And I remember sitting at school one time, looking out the window in a rare uh, kind of moment of uh, kind of presence of, of mind and uh, looking out and thinking, who are all these people? Where are they coming from? <laughs> they, they, they weren't born here. <laughs> They've all moved in. Yeah. And so I just wanted to say that I think for me, all these books... You've explained that to me. Oh, all right. right, thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. What those people were actually at that time was the, I, I suppose if it does you familiar with Sean O'Casey's plays, they're set in the inner city of Dublin. They were the grandchildren of Sean O'Casey moving out <laughs> into the suburbs of Dublin, taking over the suburbs of Dublin, uh, much to my delight. Yeah. Hello. I met you on a movie set uh, in Dublin, and uh, you were very uh, easy to meet. But I wanted to ask you about a, something that I believe the Irish writers are among the best in the world. And I attribute it to the fact that they help one another and that the pug, uh, the uh, pub culture was a positive influence. In the changing world of technology, is that still so? Are you people helping each other, criticizing and sort of a fermentation to improve? Or is this all I don't know. Uh, I can think of true. one pub in Dublin where if you throw a successful writer, however you measure that into it, he's going to, you know, he's, he's going to crawl out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not drunk, but beaten. <laughs> um, I was with a friend of mine, a Libyan writer, <laughs> and we were walking by a pub called Grogan's and I was telling him it's full of bitter unpublished poets I think. <laughs> and he says oh please can we go in there and I said no 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 we're not going in. <laughs> so he persuaded me easily persuaded to go in and I was only in the door and kind of walking up to the bar to order two pints and a guy turned around looked at me and said what the fuck are you doing in here <laughs> 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 So I'm not altogether <laughs> sure about the Mutual Support Society. <laughs> yeah, I, I, and the pub thing, you know, if you look at the lives of the 1950s writers, some of the glorious names that, you know, are on tea towels and things like that. And <laughs> they spent a lot of time working on the image, really. You know, Brandon Bean gave up writing and spoke into a mic and spoke into a tape recorder because he was busy being an alcoholic, sadly, and died when he was much, much younger than I am now. And it's sad to think... You know, it's a waste, really. And they, uh, so the, no, the the association of writing and the pub, I don't, I don't really get it. You know, I enjoy going to a pub, but I don't bring me work with me, and I'm not researching. I'm slowly drinking and I'm talking to people, and I don't want to hear music either. I know, I, you know, I don't want to hear diddly idle, diddly idle, idle. <laughs> you know, don't want to hear it. <laughs> you know, just want to chat. So, um, but yeah, I do think, by and large. If we can put the poets aside, the fiction writers tend to be quite nice and quite civil with each other. <laughs> Any more? I'm not going to let it go. Okay, thank you. The I, I just want to know what you're working on next. Uh, this lady here wants to know what I'm working on next. There's two things. I, I usually, more often, in fact, always when I've finished a novel or when it becomes published, I've always been working on a new one. But this time around, I'm not, because I, when I finished this novel, The Guts, I went more or less straight into rewrites of The Commitments musical, because we, uh, getting the rights to songs was a bit hair-raising, and uh, we didn't get the rights to quite a few, and I had to go looking for other songs. And after that, I began to you know, think around, what well, I'll have to write a new novel now. This will be around October, November. And I started writing a television series, and I've written the first episode of that. And it's, it, it may never be made. These things are, it, the, big, the word if hovers over everything involving, you know, money, really. But a bit, a bit of luck, it'll be made. And I've written the first episode of that, and hopefully, been commissioned to write the first episode, and hopefully out of that will grow a series, you know. Because I haven't done one in a year, in a long, long time. And, I, you know, I kind of like to do it again. And, um, you know, it is the golden age of television, I think, somehow or other. Box sets are the... The, the mark of a man, really, aren't they now? The box set. Um, 
and uh, another thing I'm doing uh, is that um, I am writing a book with a Irish soccer player, a well, an ex-soccer player called Roy Keane. And you know, uh, even outside the world of football, people have heard of Roy Keane. And uh, I lived in I lived for six months in New York in it, actually ten years ago. Uh, I was teaching there for just a, a semester, and uh, my family were coming over around about this time of year, maybe late February, and I was buying some bed clothes for them. And I went into a store on Broadway near where I lived, and I bought this stuff, and I handed my credit card, Bank of Ireland, to uh, a, a young African man behind the counter. And he looked at it, and he said, Ireland, Roy Keane. <laughs> he didn't say Bono. <laughs> he didn't say James Joyce, St. Patrick, or all the others. He said Roy Keane. So um, I was approached about the possibility of doing that. So again, it's uh, I... As I said earlier, essentially I write novels, but I decided some years ago, if something, <coughs> if some possibility or invitation is put in front of me where it seems like in a, in a childish way, and it's going back to do we ever mature, if it seems in a way like a once in a lifetime opportunity, not necessarily a new career path, because that doesn't interest me at all. So the musical was just that, happy to have done it once, no burning need to do it again. And this is another thing because uh, Roy Keane I think, in a way, divided Ireland in a way that hadn't been, uh, it hadn't happened since the Civil War, and um, so just uh, you know, it's it's it, so I was I, I said I'd do it, and I'm happy that I'm doing it. So can't talk about it much because it's not written, but um, that's what I'm doing. That'll occupy me now till late June. It's a very tight working. It's one of the reasons why I agreed to do it as well because it's a very tight, busy patch, and it also gives me the excuse then to do nothing for a while, which is always quite welcome. <laughs> I wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to do with me. Yeah, go on. Yeah. Well, you had a, a, in one of your earlier novels, you had a bigger participant in the Rising. Uh, it's going to be the centenary of the Rising soon. Ireland, very different place. Uh, you know, you've had the IMF um, basically coming in, providing all those funds. Um, I don't have many profound thoughts about New Ireland in 2016. I think really this, most countries' internal struggles are about who defines what it is to be Irish or American or Serbian or German or these nationalities. Who controls the picture? Who, who controls the culture? And I think that's what's been going on in Ireland and everywhere else all my life, certainly. And to be Irish has shifted and changed quite dramatically, you know, in, in small but significant and sometimes ways that don't seem significant until later on throughout my life. So it's easy enough, you know, I've got an Irish passport, so that makes me Irish, but as to what that means, I don't really know. <laughs> and it doesn't keep me awake. <laughs> you know, it doesn't really keep me awake. I, I have no religion, for example, and to, when I was a young man, that made me somehow less Irish. Nobody could give a damn now, you know? Somebody gay living in the Republic of Ireland would have felt somewhat less Irish. I don't think, by and large, they would feel that way now, although I'm not altogether qualified to say that. But I don't think it would be as overt, shall we say. So the shift and the change has been quite dramatic. When I, not so long ago, if I drove north, it was glaringly obvious when you crossed from the Republic into the six counties. Glaringly obvious because you were stopped, and you were searched, and the quality of the road changed, the currency changed. Now you drive straight through, and it's hard to detect, particularly if you've never done it before, where one ends and the other begins. The currencies are different still, but, and the differences are there, but they're not as glaring or as stark as they used to be. 1916, or at least 2016, will be an interesting time because it will there will be a lot of uh, talk about what it is to be Irish and what independence means. I mean, did we when we joined the EU, which is possibly a good thing? Certainly, it seemed that way six, seven years ago. Did that make us less independent? At one level, yeah, but at other levels, no, because it made us, in fact, at one point, more confident. 
which is a form of independence, shall we say. I think that's up for grabs now because it turned out that the EU was all about money. It's not about society. It's not about being nice to your neighbour, really, although maybe the people who put it together after the war felt that way. It's all about money. And that was a bit embittering. But is, are, would I want us to leave the EU? No, don't think so. But I do know on a, on a, on a rather facile level that you know, one of the key buildings, not just for 1916, but for the War of Independence and the break from Britain, is the Mansion House in Dublin. And Sinn Féin have had the Mansion House booked for Easter 2016 <laughs> for years. They were way ahead of the rest, <laughs> as is often the case. I do think those of you interested, uh, you know, Gerry Adams will, I think, to the bitter end, remain the leader of Sinn Féin until 2016. It's almost religious. <laughs> it is quite religious. But it will be interesting to see what happens, yeah. But uh, I've been asked to be involved in various, you know, symposiums, things like that, but I'm going to stir away from it. I don't, I'm not, I'm not a historian, so I'm not, you know, I'd, be, I'd rather observe than be involved, you know. And that's the way I react to most things. I'd rather just observe like everybody else and let, let it percolate. But uh, I don't know if I have anything big to say. You know, my political opinions, most of my opinions I share with so many people. It's just, you know, the one thing I do is write fiction. And that's, that stands out a bit, I suppose. But uh, it will be an interesting time. There have been, you know, I, I did a, the novel you were talking about was A Star Called Henry. And it was close to being made into a movie some years ago, but um, we had about two thirds of the finance. But unfortunately, these things in the movie, the world of the movies is horrible. It went from what they call hot to cold in the space of an afternoon. <laughs> we had a star, then we didn't have a star. He was back, he wasn't. Will you go to Prague to meet the star? Sure, the star isn't in Prague anymore. And then it was over, it was gone. <laughs> but there's been interest in it since, and you know, I don't know, and the stage adaptation and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see. But whether as a writer I'm looking forward to it, not particularly. As a citizen of the Republic, yeah, I probably am. Although, it's a, it's a decade of anniversaries. Because, you know, if you, uh, in the Republic, 1916 means the 1916 Rising. For a lot of people in the North, it means the Somme. Small island, you know, two big differences. I was just going to say earlier that uh, <coughs> your uh, b collection, The Deportees, kind of answers what is Irish too. Mm. That uh, since you wrote your first book, that uh, the definition of a dub has changed a lot too. And yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. it's, it's really, um, there's so much more filtered yeah, in well there. One of so. the, the last census, I think, indicated that mm. one in 10 people living in Ireland weren't born in Ireland, but they're Irish. Uh, there were two, you know, a sad fact, a sad piece of news last week was that there was a fire in a hostel, a student hostel in Brussels, and two Irish kids died in the fire. When you see their names, you'd be thinking, they're not Irish, there must be a mistake. But they are, they were born in Ireland. Their parents, I think, were Polish and Latvian. And uh, we were told the, the easy cliche, when the economy collapsed, we were told, oh, they've all gone back. But anybody with a working set of ears knows that is not, is not the case. And I work with a lot of teenagers, and a lot of them are of Polish origin, either born there or uh, born of Polish parents. And a lot of these working class kids, Latvian, Polish, Estonian, African, you know, Nigerian, and they've got an incredible facility with language because they have their own language that is, they're using at home. They have the English, they have Irish, and then they have also usually a European language. But because they're working class kids, very often this skill isn't being recognized at all because it's not coming from the right angle as far as officialdom is concerned. But you're right, yeah, in my the deportees and other stories I've written, there's probably a collection, I've written those kind of multicultural stories since, there's probably a, a collection there, uh, if I gather it together, another one, um, are my tiny little attempt to redefine Ireland as well. You know, that uh, it, it's, uh, it's great. Again, that notion that, oh, the economy's collapsed, we're back to being red-haired Guinness drinking, <laughs> Picks again. Uh, we're not. We're not. <laughs> I think that has to be it. Thank you Grant. so much. Grant. Thank you. Thank you very much.